Welcome to Screw the Commute, the entrepreneurial podcast dedicated to getting you out of the car and into the money with your host, lifelong entrepreneur and multimillionaire, Tom Antion. Hey, everybody, it's Tom here with episode 113 of Screw the Commute podcast, and I'm here with Yannick Silver, and uh, wow, this guy is such a big thinker. It's going to be not typical for our show. <laughs> <laughs> we're pretty lowbrow around here, but this guy's a big thinker. We go way back. We we're almost neighbors back in Maryland when I lived in Maryland. We had dinner together and stuff, and we've spoken on stages together, and I spoke at his birthday bash, like, I don't know, 15 years ago. And my video guy just happened to find the tape of that in our archive recently, so I'm going to look at that. And I was going to say, uh, uh, you know, Yannick looked really young in that tape, but the damn guy looks young all the time. <laughs> It really sucks. It's not fair. Um, so uh, episode 112, hope you didn't miss that, was one of my Monday trainings. And I do an in-depth training every Monday and interview great entrepreneurs on Wednesdays and Fridays like Yannick. This Monday, I talked about contests and how you can build massive lists and uh, make lots of sales using contests. So don't forget to check that out. Our podcast app is in the iTunes store. You can uh, check it out at screwthecommute.com slash app. APP. We've got all kinds of training on how to use it in case you're not familiar with using all the cool features that take us with you on the road. And our Roku TV channel is now live. We may have a couple channels live by the time you listen to this, but uh, the public speaking channel is on Roku TV, and you probably have a hundred thousand bucks worth of public speaking training there and professional speaking training. And if you don't know what Roku TV is, you might even have one and don't know it. A lot of them are enhanced for Roku. It's an on-demand TV service, and a lot of people are getting rid of cable uh, because of that. And you could go buy a $40 box and plug it into your smart TV and, and have thousands of channels at your disposal, and you can make your own channel nowadays. So that's what uh, we did with the public speaking channel. And we've got uh, Brutal Self-Defense coming, and we have Protection Dogs Elite coming, and various internet marketing stuff coming. So watch for that. Now, our youth program is in full swing. We're highlighting a uh, entrepreneurial youth. And when I say youth, that's up to about 22 years old or early 20s. And uh, we, we really want to get that generation going with entrepreneurism. So we want to highlight somebody. If you know anybody, have them contact me at orders at antion.com. And I can show them how they can apply to maybe be featured on an episode of Screw the Commute. All right, today's sponsor is the Distance Learning School, the Internet Marketing Training Center of Virginia. Don't even think about retraining yourself or sending your kids to college until you check out our webinar on higher education. I don't want you wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars and putting yourself and your kids under crushing debt. I mean, we'll have uh, the webinar in the show notes at screwthecommute.com slash webinars. All right, let's get to the main event. Yannick Silver really redefines how business is played in the 21st century. He's at the intersection of more profits, more fun, and more impact. He's the author of several best-selling marketing books and tools, including Mar uh, Maverick Startup, Instant Sales Letters, and I think it's his latest, the, the book Evolved Enterprise. Uh, Yonix is the founder of Maverick 1000. It's a global collective of top entrepreneurs and industry innovators who assemble for breakthrough retreats, rejuvenating experiences, and giving forward opportunities. His lifetime goal is to connect visionary leaders and game changers to catalyze innovative business models and new ideas for solving 100 of the world's most impactful issues by the year 2100. He's truly changing the way business is played. Yannick, are you ready to screw the commute? I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready for both of them. I got to say commute because I don't want Missy coming here thinking I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, That's right. Oh, man, it's great catching up with you. It's, so, it's been a long time. And, uh, yeah, thanks for reaching out. And, you know, I'm excited to hear what, what's new in your world and, and catch up with you. Yeah, I've been watching this uh, Maverick stuff you've been doing and these these events you've been doing for a long time, and uh, and it's just uh, it really is changing a lot uh, the way people are thinking about business. So tell everybody about uh, what you, what you've been doing lately, and then we'll take you back 
to the beginning to see how you evolved into this. Hey, hey yeah. Where are you evolved. See, there that, you go. That's right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, the main thing that I've been working on lately is is really this notion of how how business can make a, 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 a difference in the world and create an impact, and what does that look like for, for business? So, you know, I'm not just out there saying, let's – you know, let's go out there and, and donate a bunch to charity and, and it doesn't have any effect on what we're doing. I think it has to have this complete combination of, of being good for business, being good for the world, being good for wanting our customers to get them to buy more, getting our team members aligned in a greater way. And it just brings you more joy and happiness. So that's, you know, what, what you mentioned, this evolved enterprise, that whole thinking. And really it came about from this whole Maverick 1000 group, which are all CEOs, founders, uh, industry leaders in about 91 different industries right now. And we get together a couple times a year and talk about how do you grow your business, evolve yourself, how do you make a difference in the world and have some fun in the process. Yeah, these people love you. I mean, the folks, the first testimonial in his book is by the Virgin guy. The, the What's that guy's name? The uh, uh, Richard Branson. Yeah, Richard Branson that owns the, the half the world and flies around it in a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Richard's one of my biggest business heroes, and it's been amazing to uh, to really build a relationship with him. And you know, I've been fortunate enough to to now even serve on one of the boards for his nonprofit. So it's been uh, it's been an incredible learning experience. And and we have you know we're actually coming up on our tenth anniversary of a trip that we do with him to his island. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really uh, some kind of experience, that's for sure. Now, I was reading your book, uh, The Evolved uh, Enterprise, and uh, it mentions something about soul in business. Can you expand yeah. on that a little bit? Yeah. So, you know, this notion of soul, right? We, we think of it as a, in, in very human terms that, that we have a soul and, and that's our, our spiritual foundation. Well, you know, in a legal sense, a business is its own entity as well. And I believe that a business actually even has its own soul. And, and when you tap into the soul of what, what a business is meant to do. So, you know, I, I hear you mentioning about the young entrepreneurs that you're featuring and mm -hmm. so forth. And, you know, obviously I can see that and hear in, in your voice, like that's, you know, something that's really, really means a lot to you. And, and so what I try and dig into is, okay, how do, how do you as the founder connect to the soul of what the business is, is meant to be doing and what's the, that greatest impact that it could be having? And again, not from just a, a purely charitable point of view, but, but how, does it, how does it make everything you know, be better? So, so even the young entrepreneur piece like that could actually be used to, to improve your profits and, and, and get your listeners and customers to be even more aligned with what your greater mission is. Yeah, and, and that's, it's, the profits have to be there because I get so many people, and I'm sure you have too over the years, that want to do such great benevolent things, but they're always broke. Yeah. So it has to be a balance here of profits and soul. It has to be all of it together. So like I talk about connecting your head, which is your business side, along with your heart, which is, you know, would you would make an impact in the world and then your highest purpose, what were you designed to do here? And it has to be all of those because if you're missing one, then then it's it's you're you're gonna be broke, like you said, but but have great intentions. Or if you're you're know, missing the other one, you're going to have lots of profits. But at the end of the day, you're going to ask, well, what was all that for? What, you know, what did I really do? What did I really contribute? And, and you don't have, you know, I think it's this greatest, I don't know if it's a paradox or just a dichotomy where you really can have both of them and, and you have to suspend disbelief for a little bit, but this is where there's tremendous, uh, like it's a seismic shift that's going on right now, Tom, where it's, if, if, if you look at stats from the last couple of years and, and beyond, uh, customers want to buy from companies that have a greater purpose and a greater mission to what they're doing. And, and this is continually steadily increasing. So it's like, you know, this is happening from the outside in, which is the customer dynamics where you're, you get to vote with your wallet and then inside out, which is team members, especially millennials, they want to work for companies that have a greater purpose and a greater mission. So it's like, you know, this is truly this, this incredible seismic shift that you can be a part of. That's something I was going to bring up because, uh, old farts like me are, ha are having trouble enforcing myself to understand the millennial generation. And then Gen Z came along and mm -hmm. uh, and we, I did uh, several interviews lately with Gen Z experts, and uh, it's like, wow, boy, they're hitting me in the head. Is like, time doesn't matter to them, you know, and and they're entrepreneurial and they want a purpose, and and I'm thinking, what do you mean, time doesn't matter? You mean I put a sign on my store that says open 
I don't know, maybe nine, maybe 10, <laughs> you know? So it's hard for us old farts to, uh, to, to do this, but it's, it's mandatory. If you want to be successful, like what you're saying, they won't, you won't, not only will you not have customers, you won't have anybody to serve the customers. If you don't come around and put this soul into your business. Yeah. But it, it's like, you know, at the deepest level as entrepreneurs, you know, we've been driven by freedom. We've been driven by, we want to put our mark on the world. We want to create value. So, you, you know, one of the things that when, when I start talking about this and evolve the enterprise concepts, you know, people are like, Oh, it's just giving back. Well, you know, you and I are both copywriters. So words are really important. And when you talk about giving back, it means that it implies that we've taken something. And as entrepreneurs, I want to be really clear that all of us are, are value creators. We wouldn't be in business if right. we weren't creating a value. So it's like, you know, we, we've already, made you know created a value for for others but by by this notion of of creating a greater impact or giving it, it just extends that value and accelerates it and and that's how you connect to all these g different generations because they're just hardwired to want to have make a difference in the world to have greater consciousness to what they do and and when you start thinking about it that way you know all these companies like there's some really big company like they see the writing on the wall um, I just saw a, an interesting article in, in Fast Company all about uh, these companies coming together, especially about plastics, right? Because the ocean has been one of my big right. uh, efforts in the last year. We got really involved in ocean impact and conservation uh, with, with Maverick members. And and so plastic is, is one of the key issues. There's about eight key issues facing the ocean right now. And the ocean is actually responsible for one out of every two breaths of air that we have. So it's, you know, it's, it's a big deal. Right. It's like try try holding your breath and only and only breathing every other time. Right, it's, right. It's, you know, it's kind of a big deal for us. And and so plastics, like all these companies have been looking at how can we reduce our plastics? How can we reduce our reliance on virgin plastic? How do we uh, use uh, plastics that are destined, not destined, but plastics that are that would be put into the ocean in some way, like divert ocean plastic, uh, recycle plastic that comes out of the ocean and then turn them into something. And all of a sudden, like you get massive consumer appeal. So like Adidas came out recently with a, a, a pair of shoes and now they have a, a whole line of them. They're called the uh, parlay shoes because it was this group. Um, it was actually an ad agency and this guy, uh, Cyril, who I've, I've, I've met and collaborated with, which has been great. Uh, so he was all about, okay, how do we divert this ocean plastic? And Adidas was his former client. And he said, let's, let's do this and, and let's use that as a thread for the shoes. And, and they created these new shoes where they've gotten, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but massive amounts of publicity from it and social media shares because of it. And it's resulted in, I think, about $100 million worth of shoes being sold uh, because of this. So, you know, it's a real concept. And, and of course, as all of us who are part of the Screw the Commute kind of movement, you know, it's really hard to think about $100 million in sales. But it starts with there's probably something that you really want to do in the world and want to have an impact in the world. And, it's, and it can start there. And then you combine it with a business model. Yeah, and I want to I want to talk about some of those more specifics that we can get started with. But it reminds me that when you're talking about the plastic, a few years back, uh, somebody built a boat out of water yep. bottles, and uh, it was based on a novel cone tiki. I think they called it boat tiki or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Remember plastic that? tiki or something plastic, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, to bring uh, knowledge to this, it needs more and more and more awareness of this issue, and that uh, what Adidas did is is great for that, but. But uh, speaking of shoes, you had a example in your book about, I think it's Tom's, which, hey, yep. I like that name. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, tell them how they evolved using that concept. Uh, and yeah. one of, it was one of, I think, 11 concepts that companies could use that you clearly outlined in the book. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I think people learn best by example. So I have 11 different mm -hmm. business models, uh, you know, because Tom's is a pretty pretty popular one now. They've grown and grown and grown. And it's funny. Uh, so, so Blake Mykoski is the founder of Tom's and he always gets called Tom because his <laughs> right. shoes are called Tom's. Right. And they're actually uh, named for shoes for tomorrow or shoes of mm -hmm. tomorrow or something like that. But so Tom's has been, you know, if you ask Blake, like he would tell you right away, like he never, ever expected it to be so big, but they really just hit on this whole idea of, of impact and their notion is is buy one give one, and it's such mm -hmm. a great marketing concept where you buy a pair of shoes, they give a pair of shoes away to uh, to a kid in a in a right. developing country who needs it, and so consumers just you know latched onto this in a big way, and I think the number is even bigger. Last time I saw him, maybe 
two years ago, we were on a, a panel together and I, I was talking about his numbers and there was something like 35 million pairs of shoes given away. Wow. Talk so about impact. That's, you know, it's tremendous, uh, the, the amount of, of, of impact that they've had and, and what that's turned into. And, and you know, I, I call this this impact scoreboard because now you can reverse engineer uh, what your profit metrics are because he, he obviously has to profitably sell 35 million pairs of shoes right. to, uh, to be able to give those away. And, and there's a, I think Bain Capital came in and they bought half of the company for like a $600 million valuation from him. So th what happens when you start adding these impact pieces in a real genuine way is you can, you can dominate an industry, um, you know, so they have a $600 million valuation, probably even more now. And they, they've evolved too, because there's some, you know, there's some flack and some of it very, very warranted about the fact that. And, you know, again, Blake never anticipated this starting it. He was just like, I want to I want to do some good. And here's what we're going to do. And they were able to get stores like Nordstrom's to carry them early on because of the halo effect that they had. But, you know, there's there's been some flack about when you do this buy one, give one model, you're taking away the the enterprise in that local marketplace. Right. By by them, quote unquote, dumping all these there shoes. There wasn't any enterprise in that marketplace or they'd have shoes. <laughs> Maybe. Well, it depends. I mean, there's, there's definitely, you know, there's shoemakers everywhere, but it's, it's just, um, you know, so it's one of those criticisms that's thrown on this model, but you know, overall, I think the impact is more than absolutely. What, how many, how many shoemakers could make 35, how many shoemakers would it take to make 35 million pairs of shoes? You know, so the kids would all have blisters and, and frostbite by the time. They got them yeah. So I'm all for this model. So, but this is a model that any company could use anybody is, no, a one a onesie one person solopreneur could use this model yeah exactly and, and so what you know when, when you went back to what you originally asked about the soul of the company i think that this buy one give one model is a great model but it's got to be done in the right way and it's got to be done in a way that really um really fits right so there, there's a company that came out recently i don't know if you've seen this they're called bomba socks yeah and i think mm -hmm. I'm sure yeah they're doing they advertise on the radio all the time yeah, yeah they, they've really really grown a lot and um and so they started off with the the notion of uh that homeless shelters the biggest need in the, these homeless shelters are socks uh and, and it's you know sounds you know odd until you think about it that you know these socks wear out a lot and and that's one of the biggest needs. So they thought, well, you know, we could donate a bunch of socks or we could come up with a better sock. And so they, they have like a, a dark colored sock, which has a uh, anti micro mm -hmm. bacterial properties to it and, and really well designed. And so they give away that sock now for every pair of socks that they've sold. And they've even got Damon John as one of their investors mm -hmm. after going on Shark Tank because he saw the power of what they're doing. And the two founders are like, I think one of them was like, I'm going to get a tattoo if we ever sell a million. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and they like did that. it like in no time at all. Yeah, he thought it'd be in 10 years and it, it was <laughs> like two and a half years. And now I think the last like direct mail piece I got from them said something like they've given away 9 million pairs of socks. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, using that model, they've, they've just exploded and it takes a great. So, you know, one thing I, I need to warn everyone listening to this is you can't just slap on this buy one, give one kind of model or any of the other models we'll talk about on something that's uh, not a great product. Like it, there's gotta be a, a real quality product to it. It's gotta have all the right pieces to it. But when when you do add this element to it, this, these evolved enterprise elements to it, then it really turbocharges what you're doing. Yeah, and it can be, you know, like you said, you wouldn't have thought of socks, but I remember back when I had my entertainment company, I was doing Santa Claus delivery, okay? And I, and yep. I uh, donated my time to uh, battered women's shelters. and. I mean, I was crying underneath the, the beard and everything because I, I didn't have anything to give them other than what they had collected. And I gave a, a lady a lipstick. Mm. That's all she got for Christmas overall. And she's in tears. That's the only thing she got. So, you know, when we live our normal lives, we take a lot for granted that some small thing like that on a massive scale can really uh, do a lot of good for people and help them out. It, it, yeah, it has a tremendous impact. And then just imagine, right. So all the stories that, that go with that, mm -hmm. um, you know, so the, the bomb if we go back to them, like the stories that they can share about, about their deliveries to these homeless shelters, the, the stories that their team members can share, you know, their customers feel like they have a new identity that they're, that they are real givers. And that's part of this whole model too, is that you're changing the identity. 
it's moving your company from a transactional company to a transformational company to even transcending what, what business can be. Yeah, and uh, just to bring some nuts and bolts into it, uh, some companies, I think United Way and things like that, use user-generated content based on stories of people they helped. And so their websites get bigger and bigger and bigger, and people see more of that and want to donate more. So uh, that's just a technique you can use to get user-generated contact from the people you helped. And it just yeah. helps more people. I'll tell you one, one good story about that, that user-generated content, and it really fits into this, is uh, one of the models, um, we call it empowered employment. And it's like bringing in people who are from underserved communities and, and making it a what would be seen as a disadvantage into an advantage for a company. And one of the the, the companies I profile, is a, they're called Giving Key. And it was started by a, a singer, and she had like this key that she really liked from an old hotel room. And on there she had engraved, I forgot what the original word was, maybe it was like joy or happiness or love or something like that. And, and she ended up, um, like she would, she would kind of make these in very small quantities. They always sold out at her concerts. And then she ended up seeing this homeless couple on like the sunset strip in, in LA and ended up kind of going over the top and, and taking them to dinner and learning about their story. She found out the guy was a jewelry maker or formerly a jewelry maker. And she's like, could you engrave this kind of key? And he's like, yeah, that would be really easy. And, and so she started creating them with him and they just, you know, just selling out and selling out. And the whole idea was that with these keys, there's a message on there and you give it to a person that needs that message even more than you do. And that's the user generated content as they mm -hmm. share these stories on their blog and have people, you know, write in about these stories and what it meant. And what they do is they have people who are transitioning homelessness actually be the people who are engraving these, these keys. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's win, 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 win. And they're able to get massive, retail distribution and celebrity endorsements because of that impact. And, and so it creates all these amazing user generated stories. Well, really great. So let me take you back to, uh, to your beginnings and how you sure. evolved to where you are now. Cause you're quite a different person now than when you first started. I mean, you're a marketer, but, uh, you did, I don't remember you espousing these kind of things in the early days. No, definitely not. I, I think there were glimpses of it. I mean, you, you know, you mentioned the birthday bash, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, that, that was, was a actually, charitable thing. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because you know I look back and and it's like every time you look back, you you see clues and hints and mm -hmm. and things that were you know that that show up in bigger ways over and over again. And, and yeah, the birthday bash was actually the biggest. I think um, what we'll say it is, but I, I'm pretty sure it was like the biggest internet marketing event at that moment, which was, was like something like 500 some people. And I said, you know, don't pay for it. It's going to be a fifty dollars donation right. to uh, to Make a Wish, and we ended up raising twenty five thousand dollars for Make a Wish there. And we had some really incredible people like you and Marlon Sanders and uh, Corey Rudel there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to remember who else was there. Actually, Bill Glazer, I think, you was there. You had some I, big thing that looked like a Santa bag. I remember it was full of cash <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah, someone gave that to me. Yes, we also had a. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a, a, a gag gift contest. Oh, right. And, right. <laughs> and that was one of the gifts. That was a really funny one. I well, uh, we're going to, we're going to take that tape and uh, digitize and I'll send you a copy of it unless you have it easily. No, I have no idea where it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> send it to me. Yeah. It was pretty funny. We had a guy with his dog singing happy birthday to me yeah. and then we had Mickey singing in it. It was really funny. And it's also really interesting. This was one of the first times we in included like an experience. Like, so we had a little bit of a birthday cake. Everyone got a tiny, tiny sliver. Right, so it was right. 500 people. Yeah. Which you really had... evolved in that for because you were going on trips and doing all kinds of adventure stuff, I think for a while. Yeah, exactly. So we still do the, you know, unique adventures and, and that's part of what we do, but it's, but that has evolved. Um, yeah. So going back to my roots, um, I have to go back to my dad because he, my, that, my family, was that your first job for your dad was for your dad yeah, or did you work right was, before that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, so growing up, uh, we immigrated from Russia when I was three years old and my dad started a medical equipment sales and service company about I think eight months after he got here, something like that. Um, and, and so growing up in a family business, you pretty much do anything and everything. And I was telemarketing when I was 14 years old for selling latex gloves, <laughs> you know, calling on my own leads and making sales commissions. And, uh, and then 16 years old, the deal with my dad was I got a car if I went out and cold called doctors. And when you're 16 years old talking to like a 50 year old doctor, it's, uh, yeah. it's a little intimidating. It's a little, a little out there, but it was amazing experience and work. And I also realized that I really hated cold calling. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> cold calling sucks, but you I learn did one. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. you learn a lot if you do it. Yeah, that's for sure. But I also learned, like, one of my doctor clients who I sold this entire surgery center to is kind of neat. You know, he gave me a Jay Abraham tape, and, and that really turned my lights on about, about direct response marketing and, and copywriting. And so I really took all of that to heart and started applying all that and helped grow my dad's business by, you know, from a small regional player to a national player because of the ads that we were, right. we were writing. And, and, you know, he's looking at this, and he's like, ah, who's going to be on this? <laughs> I called my dad Joe as we worked together. I'm like, Joe, just you know, let's let's try and see what happens. And and we were getting like a thousand percent return on, on these ads. And it was just, you know, really, really powerful. Like full page ads, all text with a little bit right, of images yeah. and uh very Joe Sugarman style, mm -hmm. very uh uh, you know, Dan Kennedy, Ted Nicholas, you know, those are some of right. Jay Abraham, obviously were some of my, my mentors there. And and so I took those skills and it was a really hard decision to leave. You know, I think a lot of people who might be listening to this are having some of those, those thoughts about, you know, leaving, staying, right? So I was working in a very, you know, relatively a great spot where I had a lot of freedom. I could, I could work on the projects I really wanted to, which are marketing related projects for my dad. But at some point I just, you know, I, at first I thought I was going to take over his company, really grow it. And then at some point I'm like, you know, there's, there's something more. And I had to follow mm -hmm. that, right? you know, that, that just internal instinct of, of, I wanted to do something else. And, and I didn't know what it was exactly, but it, that was when the internet first was starting to come on my radar. So late 99. And I, I think you were on there before. Oh yeah. I, I hit a 94. Yeah. Right. As yeah. soon as it came, I was right. Yeah. All yeah, over so you were you and like Corey Rudel, Mizell. Well, I learned from, uh, yeah, I didn't make anything for the first two years until I took training from Corey Rudel. Yeah. I remember, I still quote Jonathan Mizell, who's out of Hawaii, uh, for those of you who don't know. And <laughs> he, uh, his, his famous saying that I love is, you don't try to build traffic to your website. You go where the traffic is and stand in front of it. Stand in front of it, <laughs> that's, yeah. That's what I love. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I thought I was late to the party, right? Like, this is late 99. Yeah. I didn't have an email address, but I'm like, okay, I understand direct response. I've been doing really well with it. And, um, and I had also been working for some clients on the side. So that's another technique, right? Is a little bit of moonlighting because you mm -hmm. have, you know, as a screw the commute person, you have, you have a lot more time than you think. If you're not on Netflix all the time, right, exactly. if, you're not on, if you're not on, I don't know, Instagram scrolling through people's feeds, like you have a lot of time. Um, and, and you, you know, it's, it's all about where do you want to put your, your time? Even if you add an extra hour each day to something that's going to be, proactively moving you towards your goal or the side project that could turn into a full-time project. So for me, it was on the side working with, the, um, because I had doctors of my clients already, I was working with them to help them grow their practice. Right. And, and so they were like, wow, this is, um, you know, you're, you're really good at this. And I'm like, thanks. And, and so I was doing that and then learning skills that would be applied to all these different uh, industries, which was the medical field. And actually, I, I take that back. To so the internet thing wasn't the first thing. It was uh, a publishing company devoted to doctors to help mm -hmm. them get cosmetic patients. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I realized that I only had a certain amount of, of leverage by doing consulting one on one, but I could create a product that could be sold to all sorts of doctors that they could use. And I remember putting out an ad in 1998 in Dermatologic Surgery journal or something like that um uh, you know coffee table reading required for everyone yeah, right. you got it sitting there and um uh, and i got 10 leads that were interested in this this program and i sent out the the report which was really a sales letter but it had some good information in there and literally on the deadline the last um you know if i would have done what what most people would have done like which would be send out one note and that's it i, I sent out three of them and followed up with the deadline and literally on the last day of the deadline through the fax machine. So I was using my dad's fax number as, uh, <laughs> as my order number. And through the fax machine, you know, you just, you just hear, right. you remember that old sound? Yeah. And everyone goes running to the fax machine to see what it was, because we used to get a lot of orders via fax for, for my dad's company. And, uh, and so I'd always run up there and I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm checking it out. I'm like, Oh my God, it's my order form. And I was like, so excited, like literally like, <laughs> you know, jumping up and down. Right. And, uh, and then I'm like, oh, I got to make this thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, so then I, uh, I wrote a note to the, to the doctor saying, you know, this is being republished. Uh, it's going to be available in the next 30 days. I didn't charge his card. And, uh, and so then I got to work. It gave me more incentive 
to to go uh, go create this thing. And every night I log out, uh, log out, I clock out at five o'clock and work until sometimes two, three o'clock in the morning on this program, which is called like how to how to cash in on more cosmetic cases. Mm-hmm. And it was, it, it was really, you know, it, it worked really well. And that ended up being my very first, uh, solo product. And, and at some point I think I was making like 10 or $15,000 a month yeah. pretty, pretty quickly. And, and I'm like, okay, I think it was, think it was a program or I mean, when you say it was a program, it was a software or it was just uh, a method that they should use. It was pretty, you know, pretty low, low tech. It was a three ring binder yeah, that had okay. a bunch of, a bunch of marketing, uh, information starting with reactivating their old patients and then moving on to how do you do lead gen for, for patients. Uh, and then, but what really worked that I learned about this was I gave them pre-done ads, letters, press mm-hmm. releases for particular procedures. And then I'd sell those as a separate thing. So they, they, there would Upsell, be like the, basically we call it. Yeah. But with, you know, one would be included and they got to pick mm-hmm. one or they could add more. So if they wanted yeah, I started with dermatologists, so they were doing a lot of tumescent liposuction, which is a type of liposuction. Right. And so they could pick that and or they could pick like the laser resurfacing toolkit or they could pick, um, you know, a bunch of them. I think I had like eight or nine of them at one point. And, and they were just pre-done ads, letters, the report, like everything that they needed uh, that they could easily fill in the blanks for. And it was really, really powerful. And so I learned about that, like the easier you made it for people, like I call this you know, giving them the fish. Right. Because right. most people, uh, you know, they, they think that, uh, you know, if the old saying is if you hand the man a fish, you feed him for a day, if you teach a man a fish, you feed him for life. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's true. But, <laughs> uh, you know, what's, what's also true is people want the fish and right. they want it they want it and they want it filled and, and they, they want don't it. want to go fishing. They just yeah. I mean, eat. I remember I remember your what did you have like instant wedding toast or something like that? Yeah, or, Instant eulogy and wedding toasts and wedding speeches. Yeah. Right. I mean that that's a perfect example of giving them the fish. It's like, that's, you know, people want that. And, and so that example really worked for me because then I, I created instant sales letters. Right. Instant very, sales letters came, came out. Yeah. Time. That was my very first product online where, you know, late 99, like I said, no email address, but I was like, Oh, this internet thing's really interesting. And, and I'm like, I feel like I can do something. And I hadn't, you know, by the way, you know, people will use all sorts of excuses. Um, and my excuse could have been, I have no tech experience. We might have to put something up there. And I just found the company that would do it for me. They probably, you know, I had no idea how much I should be paying or not, but I ended up it was something like $1,800 or $1,500 for me to get going and starting out of a one bedroom apartment, you know, sounds like an infomercial <laughs> and, I, I had no tech skills whatsoever, but put up the the web page, the, the sales page, really, to go sell these things. And I remember the very first time uh, seeing an order come through on my on my email address. It was, <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those moments that is just, you know, it, the poignant, right? Like exactly. that whole it page you. while you sleep, and it was it was so powerful. And it was I don't know what it was twenty nine ninety five or something at the time. And I was like, holy cow! You know, so. <laughs> So I actually did this and I didn't have my merchant account set up, so I couldn't even take their money, but, but it, it just was so powerful. And I think we made like $1,800 that month and then $3,400 the next month. And it went up. Were you married at the time for this? I think, uh, I was engaged. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, we were living in one bedroom apartment and, and Missy was going to work. And so I was just trying to figure this thing out. And, and she would come home and every once in a while find me out on our on our balcony, like drinking a beer and hanging out. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> the, the internet's working. <laughs> so how did so when did you start evolving to this much higher? I mean, you had a from standing back. I mean, it might have been a slow evolution, but from standing back. To me, you took a big jump in your deep thinking of the higher level looking at business. Yeah, so it was interesting because so the instant sales letters really led me then to people saying, hey, how did you do this? Could you help me? Which then led to a whole nother mm-hmm. career teaching people how right. to take knowledge, expertise, sell it online. And, and that was really impactful and, and really rewarding and, and financially rewarding as well. I was helping a lot of people. And about... 10, 11 years ago now, I guess closer to 11 years ago, I just asked myself a really simple question. And it was, you know, would I be happy doing what I'm doing now for another 10 years? And if I was real honest, my answer was no, I wasn't, I wasn't happy. And it, it seems kind of 
strange because looking from the outside in, making a lot of money, uh, helping a lot of people, great family, great reputation in the digital marketing mm-hmm. space, which yep. is not that, that easy. Um, and also, um, you know, driving the hot sports car and so forth, like, you know, just everything that you would quote unquote think that you would want. But for me, there was like this nagging little voice saying, you know, I think there's something more you can do. And, and I, I, I've just recently seen this quote from Oprah, which really resonates with me because that was the same way I was thinking, which her, she had a quote that said, um, my, my ultimate fear is that, or, or my greatest fear is that my, I won't reach my, or fulfill my ultimate potential. And I'm like, ooh, yeah, really? He, he, yeah, that's a big one. You know, like Oprah is saying this, right? right? He, who's, who's had a lot of success, and and that was what I felt like, like this whole notion. So, you know, am I happy? Would I be happy doing this ten years from now? And I call it this cosmic alarm clock. And this cosmic alarm clock goes off, and like you can either hit snooze and go back to bed and do the same thing that you've always done, or you can you can follow your heart, which is really scary, frequently scary, but never wrong. And so my heart was saying, okay, I want to put out, you know, what would make me happy? And I spent a lot of time journaling. I love journaling as a process for entrepreneurs. I do it every day. And, and so in my journal, I was just thinking about, okay, what would be the ultimate sort of expression of what I want to do? It was hanging out with amazing entrepreneurs. It was taking cool trips. It was having business sessions in the middle of nowhere. And it was having a charity component, right? So we created... So that was what what Maverick became, and it was these three interconnected circles. Originally, a dollar sign, happy face, and a heart. And so that was the the essence of it. And the essence. How'd you come up with Maverick? How'd you come up with that? Term? So yeah, it's funny. Um, originally, I was playing around with this idea of millionaire business adventures because I like the acronym of MBA. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, millionaire is just so. I don't overused, know. Overused, like, yeah. Overused, yeah. and it just has a you know, not a great connotation, right? Like who wants to be a millionaire business adventure? Like that sounds kind of ostentatious. And and so then I'm like, you know, what's another good M name? And Maverick just came to me and I'm like, God, that's a good one because it really creates an identity. And that's, that's what we've done, you know, for the Maverick members, like they truly have an identity and it's really powerful. And, you know, you mentioned Branson at the beginning, Mm -hmm. he's one of the best branders out there, obviously with Virgin. And I got, one of the best compliments from him once he's like, he's like, how'd you come up with that? I'm like, Oh, you know, it just came out from this. And he's like, oh, that's a good brand. And you know, that, that's a, that's a pretty good high five. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. tell them about how they can get the, get the book. Yeah. So the evolved enterprise book is out. Uh, and this is, I truly put my heart and soul into this book. Uh, it includes my own doodles as well. That's, that's another piece that I've evolved in is, is my artwork and, and kind of just expressing myself that way. So you get, you get some of my doodles in there. And Amazon uh, or EvolvedEnterprise.com is we have a special edition that has a, a greater impact that we work with, um, I think, Village Enterprise to help them uh, create micro enterprises and mm-hmm. train micro enterprises in East Africa. So there's a special edition that's on that website or you can just grab it on Amazon. All right. So great. So make sure you catch that in the show notes, folks, and uh, get over and get that because it really is an eye opening book of how you can look at your business. So. We've got to take a brief sponsor break, and when we come back, we're going to ask Yannick what's a typical day look like for him and how he stays motivated. Folks, you can check out my school, imtcva.org, and learn how you can have a lifestyle business in as little as six months. And let me ask you, do you know what colleges and universities are doing? Well, according to gradeinflation.com, they're raising grade point averages to make it look like they're doing a better job of teaching when there's a mountain of evidence that they aren't. I mean, they're making students feel smarter when they're actually dumber. And you don't want that to happen. You don't want to mortgage your house to pay for that kind of stuff. So really watch the eye-opening higher education webinar at screwthecommute.com slash webinars to potentially save yourself and possibly your loved ones, friends, and even neighbors hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt when they go for higher education. But be prepared to be mad because uh, in my consumer advocate role, uh, some of the things these colleges and universities are doing to me looks downright fraudulent. And I don't want that to happen to you. So check it out, scoothiecommute.com slash webinars. All right, let's get back to our main event. Yannick Silvers here, a longtime friend of mine, so thrilled with his evolution into one of the top thought leaders in the, in the world, I, w- I would say at this point. 
So what's a typical day look like for you? You still forcing Missy to go to work and you sit home on the balcony or what? <laughs> <laughs> you pretty much. No, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, typical uh, day is, is getting up and there'll be some sort of small morning ritual. Uh, usually starts with uh, drinking some some uh some water with with lemon ideally mm -hmm. and then and then meditating for uh, 15 20 minutes and if i got enough time getting a, a small yoga session in as well and then and then i'll hit something uh depending on what's going on it could be it could be meetings it could be me doing some writing uh or it could be you know just some some calls uh but i don't know there's no real typical you day you still live in the same place well, yeah from when it, i knew yeah, I think so. Yeah, because there's be there's no better place on earth to screw the commute than where you live. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, DC has some of the worst traffic out there. And, yeah. Uh, every once in a while, when I venture out of the house to go to a meeting in DC, I'm like, wow, this is. I remember this. This is not this. You know, this is not ideal. Yeah, it's worse than ever. I mean, you, even when I was there, I mean, it's been I've been out of there for 16 years or so. I mean, it used to be like okay, you could plan. Okay, avoid the morning rush hour, avoid the lunch rush hour, and avoid the, the evening rush hour. No, yeah, it's like oh, rush oh. hour 24-7. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. And, you know, if that doesn't encourage you to to, to, to do something else entrepreneurial, then I don't, I don't know what else. Well, I tell people, I mean, you know, because my resume looks like BS. And I say, look, I have never had a job. I've never been wasting my life commuting. You can almost live two or three lives if you're not sitting in traffic making somebody else. <laughs> yeah, and and so what I, I do want to tell people, and first of all, I want to congratulate them for listening to this because that's taking one of the first steps exactly. towards, towards changing your life. And I used to talk about, and I learned this, I think, from either Jim Rohn or Earl Nightingale. I can't remember who, but they would call it, or maybe Brian Tracy, they called it a university on wheels. Right. And, 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 you know, you talk about, um, you know, colleges and what's going on here. Like, I, I believe that you can get so I went to college, I graduated, I have a, a BS degree in marketing, which is kind of what it is. And, <laughs> in fact, and but a top 25 business school. Right. And I didn't I didn't learn anything that I applied today necessarily from my marketing classes, but I learned everything that I needed from self-directed learning. Right. And there's exactly. so much information out there. And, and I believe I've learned this from Earl Nightingale way back. And if anyone doesn't know who he is, <laughs> you know, please listen to his stuff because he was one of the greatest success philosophers uh, of all time. Yep. And his, you know, it might, it might sound a little dated, but his material, the fundamentals are still the fundamentals for a reason. And one of the things he would talk about is that you can become an expert in any subject by learning or studying one hour a day for three years or a world-class expert for one hour a day for, for five years. And when I was getting going, I thought, well, what would happen if I did this, you know, learn about direct response marketing or copywriting or psychology for two hours a day or three hours a day? What would that look like? Right. And, and it just accelerated everything that I was doing. So, you know, you got to put the time in. You're going to put the time in regardless and your time's going to pass. So why not do it towards something that that you really want to you really want to do? And that'll pay back to you. Yeah, because people have so many mindless activities at their fingertips right this moment when I see somebody playing these crazy video games. Now, had they developed and made millions making the video game? Okay, I'm okay with that. But yeah. but somebody just mindlessly playing these games and sticking it in front of their kids to mindlessly play them as babysitters. And it's just, uh, it's it's crazy to me when there's so many things that could, could make uh, you, uh, your life better and all these things you're doing for other people better. I mean, but the, uh, the mindless options are just too many right now there is too many and it's too easy to get wrapped up into that you know my, my kids they're sick of me talking about it but i talk about being a creator versus a consumer right and when you are you know a consumer and it's okay to be a consumer sometimes because you know i'll you have to I'll, be sometimes I'll, yeah. yeah i'll binge watch you know a show or something like that but i know i want to do it with intention like the more you can bring intentionality consciousness to what you're doing and that's for everything you know i i, I really enjoy like experiments. And, and so, because there's an end date, you can see what happens, especially even like health related ones or, or just, you know, let's say you want to add a mindfulness practice or, or anything else. Like, you know, I've also done 33 days of, let's say no drinking or, or no sugar or something like that. And, and these little experiments have an end date, which is great. Or you could try it with journaling or anything that you want to add. And then you see, like, is that something I want to keep doing and add to my life that hasn't made a difference or not? 
and and you can continue improving and evolving that way. Yeah, and I think the Japanese call it kaizen, uh, you know, continuous improvement. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's like, uh, and then and then, you know, that's a fancy way to say it. I had an old coal miner guy who's in his eighties tell me, you know, Tom, the schoolhouse door is always open. <laughs> and then that's, just, that's exactly right. That's right. It. That's right. It. Right on. Yeah. So great to catch up with you, man. I really appreciate appreciate you coming on, taking the time. Of course, uh, you know you're probably sitting on a balcony and poor Missy's slaving away somewhere. That's right. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's good catching up with you. I hope uh, hope to see you when you get. You say you're coming down my area for some soccer stuff with your kids. That's yeah, great. Ice hockey. Yeah. Oh, ice hockey. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they don't let me on the ice hockey rink because uh, you know they gotta crack the ice and get the zamboni out it's a liability <laughs> so uh yeah thanks so much man and uh, we'll have your book in the uh, show notes and you got any big events coming up or any uh, big stuff coming up yeah we got a really interesting one that we do it's gonna be our five year anniversary of something we do called camp maverick mm -hmm. and, and this is available to it's beyond maverick members themselves uh we open it up a, a little bit to the public it's a it's an application process but it's about 120 amazing entrepreneurs, and we bring them to a campsite, basically like summer camp that you might have experienced as a kid. I didn't experience it as a kid because I was an immigrant child, but my kids do. They go away for six weeks now and one of them for three weeks. So it's like they get to experience sleepaway camp. So we created a camp for entrepreneurs that would have this sleepaway camp experience but also have amazing speakers, presenters, plus all the camp experiences, plus a lot of fun and activities. And it's always incredibly highly rated and people love it. It's in August. Uh, I mean, is it like, intense or is it it's just the name of it? No, it's not tense. Yeah, okay. we, we, <laughs> we, uh, we, we wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Uh, it, it's air conditioned cabins. So it's oh, luxury okay. cabins. You even have, uh, where is it? It's in the Poconos. This oh, year. nice. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it'd be cooler up there in August because it's, it's in be. the mountains, right? Yeah, exactly. It's in the mountains. You got the lake. It's, it's beautiful. And, uh, and it's the, the website is go camp maverick.com. Go camp maverick.com. We'll have that in the show notes for everybody. And what kind of speakers do you have? And what kind of, how's it go? How's the event go? Uh, usually there's a, a business related or growth related speaker in the morning. And then we bring in some interesting presenters. It's kind of a choose your own adventure. So you have, you, you get to pick whatever topics you're really interested mm -hmm. in. And, and so you get unknown speakers and known speakers. Um, so we've had, uh, Brian Smith who founded Uggs there before we've had, uh, Orrin Claff, who's an amazing sales presenter, uh, Sally Hogshead. This year we have, uh, Joe DeSena, who's the founder of Spartan coming and then uh also a woman named marcia wider who who uh she she created a book called dream and created this whole dream university she's been on oprah several times and and i think this is her she's basically semi-retired uh I've, I've convinced her to come out of retirement in italy to come come speak wow. to us so it's it, it should be a, a lot of fun yeah so here here's a challenge for you yeah make some kind of floating speech not like a cruise ship it's some like big barge and have, a, have, to have that on the lake. lake. Yeah, the well, lake. Well, maybe if uh, you come, we'll, we'll do that for you. No, no, I don't go near water. Uh, it, you know, I live right by the beach, but I stay away from the beach because I can't stand it with those harpoon wounds when the whalers go by and try to get me. <laughs> so, all right, man. So good catching up with you. And, uh, and uh, yeah, people are going to love this episode because it's, uh, it's quite a, a departure of our just – you know, nuts and bolts kind of stuff. This is a high level thought of where your business could be and where you could take it and how much good you could do in the world. So thanks for doing what you do, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for, uh, thanks for letting me share this with your audience. Tom. Yeah, my pleasure. So check everything out in the show notes, folks, the camp and the uh, book that, uh, that Yannick has. And don't forget to uh, get the, the podcast app at screwthecommute.com slash app. And we will catch you all on the next episode. See you later.